What we do know is with a lot of, especially the older antipsychotic medications and mood stabilizers, a lot of the older ones are associated with increased risk of insulin and glucose imbalance, similar to what the steroids do, and weight gain, and they can promote prediabetes. And so that's a big concern. And the idea is that the newer versions of these have less of that impact, and often they're marketed as having no metabolic detrimental impact, and that's just not true. This is Fat Science, a podcast dedicated to the science of why we get fat. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to replace professional medical advice. I'm Dr. Emily Cooper. I've been treating patients with metabolic issues for over 25 years. I'm on a mission to raise awareness about metabolic dysfunction and why diets don't work. Hi, I'm Andrea Taylor. I've been fat, very fat, chubby, morbidly obese, and done almost every diet ever invented. They all worked until they didn't. I've known Dr. Cooper forever, but when I became her patient and we learned metabolism was the real problem, wow, everything changed, and I've never been healthier. And I'm Mark Wright. It's time for Fat Science. Wait, does this podcast make me look fat? Welcome to Fat Science. I'm Mark Wright, along with Andrea Taylor and Dr. Emily Cooper. It's so good to see you both. Welcome. Hello. Great to see you guys. On the show this week, medications that can cause metabolic problems. Little did we know, Dr. Cooper, that there were all kinds of medications that can kind of mess with our metabolism. So this is going to be a really interesting episode to learn about that. I think we should probably set the baseline, though, by discussing once again what metabolic dysfunction is and what metabolic syndrome is so that people have that down. Sounds good. Well, metabolic dysfunction is an overarching term applying to so many different types of metabolic disturbances um, that occur clinically. So it includes just almost anything you can think of that has to do with the disruption of the metabolic system. Whereas metabolic syndrome is a very specific syndrome that has to meet certain criteria. And so metabolic syndrome is a type of metabolic dysfunction, and it is characterized by meeting three of usually five different signs and symptoms. And so it involves a combination of things, usually problems with glucose or insulin regulation, and then also possibly po problems with your blood pressure, elevated blood pressure, such as hypertension and cholesterol issues, especially that have to do with triglyceride elevations and low HDL cholesterol, which is the nicknamed good cholesterol. And then the other would be fatty liver disease. Those are the common ones. And a lot of people include high body weight or increased waist circumference. I tend to not include that in the characterization just because I feel like it's sort of a cop out. I feel like we want to see three other manifestations. And so metabolic syndrome also does occur in completely normal weight people. And so it's a very important syndrome to identify because if you have a patient with metabolic syndrome, it means they're at greater risk for heart attack, strokes, and diabetes. So metabolic syndrome is one part of the spectrum of metabolic dysfunction. What are some of the diseases that we would see in just metabolic dysfunction? Well, if you have just isolated type 2 diabetes, for example, that's a form of metabolic dysfunction. Or if you have what used to be called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease just on its own, now it's termed metabolic dysfunction associated liver disease. So if you have these isolated elements, even obesity with good, otherwise good health, there's usually an underlying problem with the metabolism that could be linked to issues with leptin levels or ghrelin levels that we've talked about before, which are hormones that regulate your metabolism. And so all of those would be different types of metabolic dysfunction. Okay. So what are some of the actual drugs and classes of drugs that can cause issues with metabolic syndrome? 
Well, one of them that comes to mind right away because it has a pretty strong impact in most people, it's the corticosteroids, which are steroid medications. And um, that could include prednisone, cortisone shots, hydrocortisone, and a lot of people use those meds that have problems with either inflammatory bowel disease, <laughs> such as what you had, Andrea, or arthritis or asthma. So that's one of the dominant ones. And how does that actually disturb the metabolism? Well, it alters your glucose and insulin regulation. And hmm. one thing to keep in mind with all of these meds, they know that they affect our metabolism negatively, but they don't actually understand exactly how <laughs> in most cases. So we have a lot of research going back many years, especially with things like steroids, because steroids have been around forever. And some of the research is contradictory. And so some studies may show that the steroids alter certain hormones in the metabolic pathway that are beneficial or that are detrimental, and other studies don't really confirm that. But what we do know is that with steroids, there tends to be an, an increase in insulin resistance and glucose levels. And so more they can actually drive people closer to prediabetes and even full-blown diabetes. Andrew, what was your experience with those drugs? Well, I have colitis, which now is actually all under control. But at the time, I had a big colitis attack, as they call it. And they put me on a big amount of steroids. And I didn't know it, but my primary care doctor was like, oh, my God, you are almost in a basic diabetic coma. And my A1C was over 8 and I had to learn how to shoot insulin. And it obviously set all my work with Dr. Cooper into a tailspin. And I had to use insulin every day. And it was kind of a crazy thing. So it put my treatment and my progress with Dr. Cooper back mm, almost about a year or like nine months or so because... I got my colitis stuff all into normal and went off the insulin and actually started on, because I had no idea about my diabetic issues or anything like that, because everything had been totally normal and totally fine before that. So they put me on metformin and everything was basically in a pre-diabetes state after that. And, but it was just the wildest thing because I had no, I had no clue. I just knew that I was kind of tired, but it was because I thought because of the whole colitis issue, but it was all because of the steroids. And so now I have it on my information, no steroids unless absolutely, absolutely, absolutely necessary, because I know that if they give you steroids, my A1C is going to go crazy, crazy, crazy. Wow. Um, that's, that's really interesting. So Dr. Cooper, this, this is a class of drug that doctors don't like to put people on long-term, right? Yeah. We try not to. Now we have to keep in mind, steroids are very important medicines in certain conditions and mm. they can really help. Um, and sometimes they are necessary. So it's true. We don't want to just jump to steroids every time you have a sinus infection or, you know, something that, could be treated in another way. But if you have to take the steroids, now we're learning more and more that it's beneficial to actually potentially add one of the anti-diabetes medications along these like heavy courses of steroids to try to prevent the problems from occurring. Now you wouldn't do that in just anyone, but in a person that's showing signs of metabolic dysfunction already in their baseline, or that is showing a worsening of their me metabolic health as they're using the steroids, you want to act quickly. And e if you can't stop the steroids, just put another medication in there that counteracts the impact of the steroids. I mean, I'm not anti-steroids because obviously it solved my other problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> right. And believe me, when I was on them, like, because you're on those, it has other side effects like, oh my God, my knees were fantastic and everything was great, but I don't want to be on them. <laughs> yeah. 
So Dr. Cooper, mood stabilizers, antidepressants, these are drugs that also can interfere. How does that happen? Yeah, they can. And it's it's through different mechanisms. And again, the studies are interesting because they started out thinking that they alter ghrelin levels. Ghrelin is that hunger hormone from the stomach. And by doing that, by increasing that, that can actually cause a lot of disruption along the metabolic pathway, not just increase your appetite, but also slow your metabolic system down. But then other studies have come along that have shown, no, that doesn't seem to be true in all the cases. And they also have looked at another hormone called adiponectin and their impact on that. Adiponectin is a very beneficial hormone produced by our body fat that actually is insulin sensitizing. So it's kind of like our own body's metformin. Hmm. And the idea was that these medications suppress our adiponectin levels, and that's how they were causing this problem. But that also hasn't been consistent. But what we do know is with a lot of, especially the older antipsychotic medications and mood stabilizers, a lot of the older ones are associated with increased risk of insulin and glucose imbalance, similar to what the steroids do, and weight gain, and they can promote prediabetes. And so that's a big concern. And the idea is that the newer versions of these have less of that impact, and often they're marketed as having no metabolic detrimental impact, and that's just not true. Even the newer ones really can still aggravate the metabolic system. So we have to be mm. really on the alert for that. But even that's meds like, well, like lithium, people take lithium for mood and lithium, it's a different kind of a concern with lithium. It's more that it can cause hypothyroidism. So it can lower your thyroid level production and that can affect also your body weight and your energy levels. Well, I do know somebody who was on some heavy duty, some, some kind of antidepressant, heavy duty medication. And I, I don't know, I saw her like maybe eight or nine months later, and there was at least a hundred pounds, you know, a significant weight difference. And I'm sure she was on multiple multiple drugs, but it, it was definitely significant. And if she wasn't, as if she wasn't depressed enough from the other thing, <laughs> this added mm -hmm. to it. And I'm sure, and it was a while ago, but I'm sure they have newer things yeah. now. Felt horrible for her. Yeah. I mean, you could see people, we often ask, you know, in our history, we always try to ask if people do have a sudden increase in their body weight or suddenly are diagnosed with prediabetes what happened leading up to that. And often you will see there was introduction of some kind of a medication yeah. prior to that. But one other way that the steroids can really aggravate things, it's also been seen with progesterone, is that it can have what's called a glucocorticoid impact, of course, because steroids are glucocorticoids, but that means a, like a cortisol-like action in the body, like our body's cortisol um, from our adrenal gland. And what that does is it feeds back in the brain and suppresses an aspect of our metabolic pathway that I think we've mentioned on the podcast before. It's called the POMC pathway, P-O-M-C. And that is a very important area of our metabolism that helps produce very beneficial hormones that regulate our body weight, our appetite, and our glucose and insulin balance. And so because those those medications kind of act to suppress that area of our metabolic pathway, that could really end up being the primary way that they cause the weight gain and the diabetes disruption. Wow. So if you get on some of these drugs and you start to notice, maybe you're gaining some weight, maybe you don't have enough energy. Um, what are some of the other warning signs, Dr. Cooper, that these drugs may be interfering with your metabolism? Well, if it starts to affect your insulin levels, you could even start feeling like you're having low blood sugar reactions hmm. because- um, Like that it, shaky kind of feeling? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Shaky feeling, um, sweaty, shaky, super hungry, craving sugar, low energy, poor focus. <laughs> That's kind of all the symptoms of the, the low blood sugar issues. And then with long-term treatment, you might start noticing um, stretch marks, or like a roughening of the skin in certain friction areas due to the high insulin levels. 
And high insulin also can actually make your muscles really tight, make you feel like you need a massage all the time. Hmm. Um, so, so those may be some symptoms that you would see, and hopefully it wouldn't be to the level of progressing to diabetes. But if you started with prediabetes and then were put on steroids without being monitored, if you start feeling thirsty all the time, urinating a lot, I mean, you, you want to hope that you didn't already get pushed into a full-blown diabetes situation. Can you name some of the drugs when we talk about antidepressants and, and mood stabilizers, just because I think it would resonate with people if, oh, I sure. take that drug. Yeah, sure. Well, some of those those medications you may re might recognize the name. So when you're talking about the antidepressants, SSRIs are very popular. You've heard that term for the, the general group of medications, but there are some such as like Paxil, you've probably heard of that one. That one is known for promoting quite a bit of weight gain. Mm -hmm. and, um, so out of the group, that would be one that <laughs> is probably the most provoking out of the group. Whereas others in that group, such as fluoxetine, which is Prozac, it's not as uh, much of a problem. Some of the newer ones, such as Lexapro, that has been promoted as not as being weight neutral, but it really isn't weight neutral. Clinically, Lexapro, as well as um, Zoloft, which is sertraline, they both are not weight neutral, although they're often promoted as that. And But they, they definitely don't have the strong impact that something like Paxil would have on the body weight. And it's not every single person that will gain weight or have problems, metabolic problems with these meds. It's mostly people who have genetics. So if you have genetics for obesity or diabetes, and then you're put on these medications, you're going to react more negatively than someone who does not have those, those genetics. But when it comes to the antipsychotic meds, these are medications like Zyprexa and Seroquel. There's a, the whole, there's a whole bunch of them. And these are kind of brand names that I'm throwing out there because people won't recognize, I don't think, the generic names. Mm -hmm. But these are also just life-saving medications. I mean, they're, they're not great metabolically, but they can really just change people's lives for the better. So again, if we have patients and they're on these meds and we realize the meds are really disrupting the metabolic system, the best thing to do is collaborate with the psychiatrist and just alert them to the metabolic things that we're seeing and why we want to put some medication in there to counteract those side effects and work together with the psychiatrist to try to see if there's any other options. Because when it comes to mood stabilizers, there are some that are weight neutral versus the weight promoting. And so maybe the psychiatrist would be open to switching that to something else if it's clinically appropriate. But again, that's a decision that has to be made by a psychiatrist alongside the metabolic doctor. You know, the metabolic doctor shouldn't start switching around psychiatric medications because they don't have a grasp of what that patient's psychiatric status is. Um, but even simple meds like blood pressure medication, cholesterol medication. There's a lot of them there too that can be metabolically disruptive. And so finding alternatives in those departments is also good. Like beta blockers, you've probably heard of. And in the beta blocker category, those are used for hypertension, but they're also important if you did have history of like say atrial fibrillation or, you know, or heart rates that are too high. So again, you wouldn't just take people off of these. The metabolic doctor needs to converse with the cardiologist and say, hey, there are certain newer beta blockers that might be less harmful to the metabolic system. Is it an option to switch to one of the newer ones that may have less of those side effects? So that collaboration is really important with switching meds around. Yeah. So what is it, Dr. Cooper, about those blood pressure meds? How are they getting in and interfering in that metabolic loop? Well, the beta blockers, again, they're not a hundred percent sure, but mm -hmm. they have noticed that these beta blockers re literally reduce your metabolic rate. So normally when we eat food afterwards, our metabolism speeds up about 10% after a meal. And with the beta blockers, they notice that it doesn't do that. So it slows down the metabolic rate, which is partly why people feel so tired when they take them. And the other thing that they do is 
they prevent what's called your adrenergic system from being overactive. That's our kind of adrenaline system. But that adrenaline system also is responsible for our a lot of metabolic functions, including liberalizing fuel sources to use as energy. So it's kind of inhibiting our fuel utilization as well, just by affecting that adrenergic system. So there's a lot of different ways that they do it. They also possibly could increase something called GABA, which is a neurotransmitter that has a lot of inhibitory impact on parts of that brain metabolic pathway. So again, they don't really understand fully what any of these medications do in terms of how they actually cause weight gain, slow metabolism, and some of them affect our glucose and insulin levels. They, they don't really fully understand the mechanism of how they're actually causing those problems. But there are things that they have observed of, you know, what they're doing in different, which medications are doing what to our metabolic system. Are there any supplements? I see ads all the time for like testosterone boosting supplements or things that will help you not eat as much or all these things. Do those, do those mess up everything? Yes. I mean, that is really good question because there's so much use, widespread use of these supplements. And my philosophy is if you look at a supplement and there's 20 or 30 ingredients in it, which a lot of them have, <laughs> that can't possibly be good because there's no way that every one of those is good for, for everyone, every person. I mean, these can have pharmacologic impact, a lot of the things that are in supplements. But when it comes to supplements, the first thing to look at is whether it's GMP certified. GMP is good manufacturing practices. And so it's a voluntary kind of certification system that just guarantees the authenticity of the supplement, meaning that it is what they say it is. So what's listed on the label is what's in the supplement. So there are no unlisted ingredients and there's no ingredients they list that are actually not in the supplement. So if you don't have the GMP certification, I, I tell patients not to take that brand because we really don't know it's not regulated. So it could have, it could even have medication in it, could have steroids <laughs> in it. And some of them have been found to have, have medication in them. So I would first focus on GMP certification then look at the laundry list of like things in there and really question, are all of those things that would be beneficial or could it be that some of those really aren't good for my body? And then there are quite a few things that are marketed for like weight loss, testosterone, sports performance, stress that, can, that do contain products that will disrupt the metabolic system. For example, some of the ones that are marketed for stress actually have bovine adrenal gland in it. <laughs> so it's actually, yeah. yeah. So That's they like cow, cow, <laughs> cow, yes. cow right. glands, cow glands. <laughs> cow, yes. Cow people, cow things. Yeah. What? Yeah. And that so it doesn't sound good. And what does that remind you of? Remember we said that cortisol production comes from the adrenal glands and cortisol yeah. is a glucocorticoid. So if you're taking bovine adrenal, it's also called desiccated adrenal. Um, Ew, that if sounds it's, terrible. Yeah, but, it, but you'll see it in a lot of the ones that are marketed for stress. And if you're taking that, what does it do? It acts as a steroid in your body. So now oh. it's going to feed back in your system, oh. suppress that part of your metabolic pathway that regulates your body weight, appetite, your glucose and insulin regulation. And it weakens your own ability to control that. And so those are particularly not good. The ones that contain glandular extracts. When it comes to testosterone, you'll see all kinds of things marketed that have absolutely no bearing on <laughs> any scientific reality. But I think it's just, you know, people are vulnerable. It's just like sports performance and weight. You'll find a lot of the same things. So you kind of have to look at the science behind it or maybe bring it up with your provider. Is mm -hmm. this legit or not? Our patients are great about bringing those to our attention because so many of them have problems. Like there's nothing wrong with antioxidants. 
but antioxidants do suppress leptin levels. And so if you have a patient who part of their, you know, weight issue is that due to long-term dieting, they have suppressed their leptin, which is that important body fat hormone that says, Hey, I weigh enough. So you don't have to conserve energy. But if you have patients who already have a suppressed leptin and then they end up taking a lot of antioxidants, it can actually push the leptin down so low that it triggers weight gain. So even simple things like vitamin C is an antioxidant. So I think bringing that up with your provider is a good thing and avoiding things that claim to produce weight loss and, and all of that. Things that claim to be natural way to get your GLP-1 hormone up. There's a lot of that marketing going on right now too. GLP-1 well, is the popular, you know, it's hormone. It's the magic word right now. Right. And well, so phrase, phrase, right. it's not a word. Yeah. And so, and that's I mean, the active ingredient in like Ozempic and all yes, that. Yes, it is. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of marketing saying that these supplements raise your GLP-1. Now I'm not arguing. There are things in nature that raise our GLP-1, foods even a lot of foods, almost every food raises our GLP one and certain foods do more than others, but it's such a small amount that it, that it accentuates. And it probably doesn't do it in people that already have dysfunction. It's probably really only something that would be limited to people who, you know, have super healthy metabolisms that it would be even of any kind of, you know, uh, detectable level. So I just wouldn't fall for all the marketing gimmicks. Yeah. So you talked about GMP as sort of a purity reliability scale, but I think we should also talk about the way that Congress has regulated the supplement industry. I see all these disclaimers, Dr. Cooper, that say these statements have not been evaluated by the FDA, which means they may be absolutely worthless as a medication, right? Right. I guess a long time ago, the citizens of this country passed laws that prevented the government from regulating our supplement industry. And that has just never been brought up again or never changed. So my understanding is that they can get in trouble if they make false claims, but someone has to report it to, I believe it's the FTC or, you know, and has to be, it's not regulated by the FDA. So they really can make all kinds of claims and they can loop you in with some trigger words like GLP-1 or leptin or, you know, different terminology. But I find a lot of times the supplements that are marketed for the things that they're claiming actually have the opposite effect. They actually would cause problems in that area, not help that area. So it's one of the things that you just want to make sure not only is it a big money making industry and you're wasting your money on a lot of these supplements, but it could be detrimental to either your health or your metabolic system. Well, you just take a walk through the aisles of your, any, any either supplement store, health food store, or just even at the supermarket or the drug store. And you can see like, there's just 8 million bottles, some with beautiful labels right. and they'll t it, you can see like this is this can't be this this can't be that i mean and then some you're just like oh maybe it is that maybe <laughs> it is that but you have to really really know what you're taking you really you do. do i think your doctor too might prescribe supplements i mean we prescribe supplements a lot yeah, too that's what i mean so you really have to know what you're taking Right. It's not Some that they don't. Some can be dangerous. They're real medicine. They have to be yes. treated like real medicine, I think. Yeah, exactly. I think that's it, that they can be part of your health regimen. And we actually do use some supplements that improve metabolic health, but they're very targeted. So, you know, it's something that we identify that's that's going wrong. And then we know that certain things in nature do actually improve that condition and they may be better tolerated than the pharmaceutical drugs, but they also are not as well studied as pharmaceutical drugs. So you do always question, is it true that they're not, you know, there's not that toxicity concern with these supplements, even if they are, you know, with the GMP certification, the actual supplement itself, we're not really sure 
you know, what possible detrimental effects it might have on health versus when we study actual pharmaceutical drugs and that's regulated by the FDA, all the studies. And then, you know, that's very transparent. So it is a trade-off. It's like people think they're safer and even providers think, well, maybe this is like milder than the pharmaceutical drug. So maybe it's a better option, less side effects. But then again, we don't know as much about them. So that's something that I'm always, you know, trying to balance too with our patients. Well, as we wrap things up, I feel like we kind of need to come back to one of your philosophies, Dr. Cooper, and that is to really pay attention to what your body is telling you, right? Right. Yeah, I think so. Listen to your body. And a lot of times people will say, you know, ever since I started this particular medication, something feels off. Hmm. And that's really good information. And um, there may be an alternative medication that could produce the same beneficial effect that medication could be switched out for. And that should be done in collaboration with your healthcare providers, you know, to really find the best match that will lead to, you know, taking care of your symptoms, but then also not at the expense of your metabolic system. Yeah. Andre, anything as we wrap up that you'd like to add? I would just like to say every body is different also. Like what affects your body with perhaps 10 or 20 or 50 extra pounds from a steroid medication or whatever may not affect the next person's body, you know? And also some of these drugs and so many of these drugs, like Dr. Cooper said earlier, are phenomenal drugs. So it's not the drug's fault necessarily, you know, I don't mean to say it like that, but it's, the drug is great. It just has other problems. It's sort of like a game of whack-a-mole. You know, you got to figure <laughs> out what's, what's the problem and how do you fix it? But it, it's sort of like what, what she just said, you have to have a great relationship with your, with your doctor to figure out how do we make the best thing happen possible and listen to your body, see what's going on. Yeah, that's great advice. And uh, I think we're, that's what I love about you, Andrea, is that you always come back to that <laughs> on a lot of these episodes is that everybody is different. It's different. We are all you know? completely unique. But this has been, this has been great advice. Um, so yeah, pay attention. If you're on any of these drugs, you start to notice that something's off, talk to your, talk to your physician, talk to your healthcare provider. And there's always a solution. Uh, sometimes it's not ideal, but there's always a solution. All right. This has been super fun. Medications that can impact your metabolism. Uh, thanks to both of you for another edition of Fat Science. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better. I'm Mark Wright. Thanks for listening to Fat Science with Dr. Emily Cooper, a work P2P production. New episodes drop every Monday. If you've enjoyed the conversation, subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. This production is for informational purposes only and is not intended to replace professional medical advice. Join us next week for another episode dedicated to the science of why we get fat. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better. <laughs>